It's Saturday, January 29th, 2010, and you're watching This Week in Linux News. In a bit of an update to last week's story about the possibility of Google copying some code from Oracle when it came to Android, as it turns out, the majority of the claims about that were overhyped and possibly wrong. Shortly after I put up the video last weekend, some new stories came out on Ars Technica and ZDNet basically saying that of the 43 files found, six of them were in a testing unit, one of them had been pulled already a long time ago, and the remaining 37 were a part of a driver package that had never actually gone out on any sort of Android-based device. So it was definitely a bit of a miscommunication, a bit of an overhyping by a lot of the media, myself included, so I do apologize for getting that wrong, but it is good to see that there is a possibility that this will not affect Google and Oracle's lawsuit one way or the other. Moving right along, let's talk about some distros that released or updated this week. First and foremost, Sabion Linux 5.5 released. From reading the release notes, it looks like this comes with the latest kernel, the latest Xorg version, the latest AMD and NVIDIA drivers. It's got the latest version of GNOME in it, and it also comes with KDE 4.5.5, which will very soon be updated to KDE 4.6. Zenwalk version 7.0 beta 1 is now available as well. If you're not familiar with Zenwalk, it is a Slackware-based distribution with XFCE out of the box instead of the default, I believe Slackware uses KDE. It's been so long since I've used it, I cannot honestly remember. Do feel free to correct me in the comments below. But this new version of Zenwalk is going to have XFCE version 4.8, the brand new, just released last week version. That appears to be the biggest change in Zenwalk so far, other than the removal of HAL, which most distributions seem to be doing at this point, finally. If you'd like to check it out, of course, we'll have a link in the show notes. In addition, Frugalware 1.4's Release Candidate 2 is now available. I seem to remember talking about a Release Candidate 1 a week or two ago, so they are well on pace to release 1.4 sometime very soon. This distro also comes with the latest version of the kernel, 2.6.37. It has a recent version of KDE, but not the brand newest one that is available. And strangely enough, one of the things they're touting as one of the newest features is that Drupal 7 is replacing Drupal 5. I'm guessing that's in their repositories. By the way, if you haven't checked out Drupal 7 yet, I am a big fan. In addition, OpenSUSE 11.4 Milestone 6 is now available, so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe the next month, we should see a new OpenSUSE release. This version also removes HAL, the hardware abstraction layer, just like so many other distros, like I mentioned earlier. All right, that's enough about distros. Let's talk about something that really might impact a lot of Linux projects for the next couple of days or weeks. SourceForge.net was attacked this week. There was a targeted attack that ended up exploiting several of the SourceForge servers, so they've gone ahead and shut down several services such as CVS, interactive shell services, and the ability to upload new releases. So with those changes, we will not see any new projects being updated on SourceForge for the time being. Hopefully they will get that taken care of quickly and we can get them back on their feet because SourceForge is an amazing resource. And speaking of attacks and hacking and exploits and things like that, somebody decided to attack the Fedora project this week. From the article that I read, they attempted to gain access by changing one of the SSH keys for one of the members of the Fedora project. They logged into the fedorapeople.org site and attempted to change the person's profile. The person was notified immediately, they locked down the server, they did a full dump of all the data, they compared everything and found out there weren't any changes that had been made. So that didn't seem to really be that much of an impact on them. But it's really interesting to see more and more of these open source, Linux, FOSS, all of those sorts of things projects being attacked. I guess it does go to show that free and open source software is becoming a bit of a bigger target, so I guess we should sort of be flattered. And speaking of Fedora, the Fedora developers are toying with the idea of changing the network device naming scheme for Fedora 15. This is expanding upon an idea created by Dell called BIOS DevName, where basically you would name your Ethernet device based on whether it's embedded, whether it's a PCI device, then give it a number and a port number. Most of the other naming conventions like VLANs and alias suffixes, they should stay the same. But for Fedora 15 and on, we might see some new devices. We may not have an ETH0 in the future. We might have an EM0 or a PCI0. So tell me what you think about that in the comment section below. Do you think it's a good idea to rename it, to standardize it so you can tell where your device is and maybe what's malfunctioning if it is? Do you think it's a bad idea because it's changing something that's been around for so long? And speaking of tossing things up in the air and seeing what happens, several developers met in Germany this past week to talk about a new possible application framework, which they were tentatively calling AppStream. From what I read, it kind of sounds like a unified installer, but kind of not. Basically, they want to take the Ubuntu Software Center front end, replace the back end on it with PackageKit, 
tie that into a search server and a rating server, a social networking type server. But at the end of the day, the package will still come from your local distro repositories or from a build service. So if a developer wanted to have their package distributed to all of the possible distros, they would upload it to this build service. It could be packaged for everything. And then through this app stream process, you could get it on whatever distro you want with one unified look and feel for the end user. Again, let me know what you think about this in the comments below. This could really change the entire face of Linux. And speaking of changing the face of Linux, just before Linus and his cohorts left to go to the LinuxCon in Australia, they decided to go ahead and push out version 2.6.38 release candidate 2. There really aren't any major changes to discuss with it, but that does push us one step closer to having 2.6.38 and all of the major performance increases that come along with it. And now to talk about a couple of software releases, OpenOffice 3.3 released this week, as well as LibreOffice 3.3. And basically, LibreOffice has all the same features that OpenOffice 3.3 has, with some additions like being able to import SVG images, having a new presenter view mode for Impress when you're giving a presentation. You can have up to 1 million rows per spreadsheet in Calc now. They've improved the WordPerfect import, and they've added a Microsoft Works import feature. So basically, it looks like some of the features coming from the GoOO project are starting to be incorporated. Hopefully, as things move along, we'll see LibreOffice start to really leap ahead as a fork, and hopefully OpenOffice will continue to be there as a good base to build upon for LibreOffice. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if you already have LibreOffice installed on your system at the Release Candidate 4 version, that is a bit-for-bit -bit copy of the final release product, so don't have to worry about updating at this point. And now let's talk about a couple more features that are supposed to be coming in OpenShot version 1.3. These developers keep teasing new features, and it's really, really looking like it's going to be a very nice, nice release when it does come out. Basically, the three new features that they're talking about are the ability to create lens flares with a lot of customization options, the ability to create snow and have it animate down the screen, and the ability to make 3D animated maps. I have to say, having Blender on the back end of this is really making OpenShot turn out to be an amazing video editor. I'm going to have to give it a shot when 1.3 comes out just to try out some of these things to see how it improves things for us. And speaking of releases, VLC version 1.1.6 is now available, which fixes a critical vulnerability. If you haven't already, make sure to check to see if that update is available for whatever distro you are on, even if you're on Windows or Mac. And speaking of releases, both of the big graphics driver developers have released new drivers this week for Linux. NVIDIA released version 260.19.36 and a new beta driver version 270.18. Now from reading about it, there are a couple of interesting things about the beta version that's coming out. For one, it's supporting Xorg server version 1.10. So these newer distros that are coming out with the newest version of Xorg should be supported by the NVIDIA beta driver, especially once it becomes stable. However, the release notes mention a 3D vision option that you can enable in the X settings as well. So not exactly sure what sort of 3D vision we're talking about here, but I think it'd be kind of interesting to have 3D coming out of my NVIDIA card on Linux. In addition, AMD released version 11.1 .1 of their Catalyst driver for Linux with an unannounced feature that may help fix all sorts of tearing issues on Linux for AMD ATI users. Basically, there's a command you can run using ATI config to enable a tear-free desktop that is supposed to make, like I said, the desktop be tearing free. This is still an issue that plagues a lot of NVIDIA users and a lot of ATI users up to this point. So if you are an AMD graphics user and you are using this 11.1 .1 driver, you might want to check this out and see if this command helps any. One last bit of software release news, and we kind of mentioned it earlier in the video. KDE version 4.6 is now stable, final, ready to go. It's available on Arch Linux already, and there is a PPA available for Ubuntu if you'd like to try it out. Of course, I'm sure it's available for a bevy of other distros, I just haven't looked at them to see which ones have it and which ones don't. Moving things on, we'll close things up with some Ubuntu news. ENAC, the interactive computing lab in France, has come up with a multi-touch system that uses your webcam on Ubuntu 10.10 and later. Basically, the video they've got embedded on their site shows them using a white panel on the ground with a webcam pointing down at it, and while they move their hands around, they can use multi-touch gestures to control the Unity interface. And of course, the one thing that I keep seeing mentioned in that article and in the comments and everything is the Minority Report style interface. I do agree, it would be very cool to have that thing available. So if you do have Ubuntu 10.10, you can download the libraries that they use and you can try it out for yourself, maybe make a video using it. I'm not currently an Ubuntu user, so I can't really do that at the moment, but I'm tempted to install it on the laptop and give it a try. And the last bit of Ubuntu news we're going to talk about today is some Natty updates. Turns out that Natty is going to get version 2.6.38 of the kernel, assuming that it does go stable and final before April. In addition, some of the latest updates show a newer version of the Ubuntu One control panel. 
an updated Unity Dash, so we are taking one step closer to having that full Unity Dash available. They've changed the resize area, so at the bottom right corner of the screen, you've still got that little resize icon. However, you can use any bit of the border now in, I believe it's a three pixel area to resize a window. They've added an arrow snap type plugin for Compass so that you can drag windows to one side of the display or the other and have it snap to fill half the screen. And they've updated the software center to allow ratings and reviews for applications. Now, of course, this is not all that we're going to be seeing out of Ubuntu. We should continue to see new features roll out before April. But that's all I've got to talk to you about today. You'll notice there wasn't any Android news today. There is quite a bit of that as well, and I'm going to have to do it in a separate video tomorrow because I have to run out the door very, very soon for a meeting with some friends. Thank you guys so much for watching, though, and I will see you next time.